Be on your best behavior, everybody. I guess I can see us all. No, not anymore. They don't. Hmm. Yeah. And don't worry, I won't be sharing this recording with like next semester's class. It's only this semester's class. All right. So this lecture is called uh, the new imperialism, imperialism, the weaponizing of ethnicity to control uh, to control land and labor. It's kind of awkward phrasing, I should, for the control of land and labor. Um, but let me back up by saying, by asking you this. Oh, by the way, this also provides context for a couple questions in channel, uh, chapter five, a couple questions in chapter eight, chapter 17 and 19. So what I'm trying to do here is offer you a different context from a different interpretation that Adam Hochschild does to help you understand what's going on here in this book. <clears throat> so this is interesting. Do you remember this woman? <clears throat> mm -hmm. What did she uh, talk to you about early this semester? Remember the a, a single story? Yeah, Victor, the danger of a single story. You have the you have a memory like an elephant, Victor. <laughs> so What's interesting, and I just learned this today talking to a colleague, that Adichie's identity, she was born in Nigeria, but she always identi identified herself as Igbo. Igbo is the name of her ethnic group in Nigeria, but her passport says she's a Nigerian nationally. Okay. Only when she moved to the United States did she realize, oh, wait a minute, here I'm looked as Black. I never thought of myself as Black in my, right, where I was born, among the Igbo community, nor in Nigeria, only when coming to the United States. What does she mean by that? And what do you, um, how do you identify yourselves? Do you all have an ethnic identity? Like, are you like a Red Bluffian, <laughs> right? Or a turn of the river, Sacramento River person? What? Give me a couple examples of what your identity are, Victor, Jennifer, or Luke, if you will. I know Rachel's a, taking care of some business. Originally from the Bay Area. I don't know what, how they call it. So do you tell people that they're like, because Americans are always famous for saying like, where are you from? Right? Yeah. And it's unique in the world. People in the world usually don't do that. Mm. Right? Here in America, we do. So what I'm getting at here is what does it mean your ethnicity? And how's that different than race? And if you take Heather Wiley's Soch 25 class, she goes into this quite a bit. What, what's the difference between ethnic, ethnicity and race? Is ethnicity your nationality? Or like German, uh, French, that kind of thing? Yeah, it's, it's, it's all messy, right? Us social, social scientists still argue about this, like what it means. Yeah, and opposed to what's your race? What does that mean? Luke, Jennifer, Victor, what does that mean? Like if you saw me in the street, what race do you think people would call me? Not necessarily you. Is ethnicity kind of how you would view yourself like the box you would put yourself in and race is how other people view you in the box they put you in. that's a good i like how you're getting at that because um race is this invented thing in the early 1600s when uh, europe various european peoples brought various african peoples over to the americas to meet quote unquote various red people so there was this invention of like white people, black people, and red people. And then later on, yellow people, quote unquote, yellow people from Japan were included in that. So it's kind of like this made up thing about your phenotype, how you look, right? What's your skin like? What's your hair like? What, how big is your nose? How small is your nose? What color are your eyes? So this, it's this made up thing in the Americas, right? Trying to identify you in this right racially hierarchical place your ethnicity however is more culturally defined like what language do you speak what food do you eat what religion and customs do you practice 
that would be an ethnic difference. For example, if the average person would see a person from England and a person from Ireland, they would think today, oh my gosh, they're the same race, right? They're both white, <clears throat> right? If they're rolling down the street of Boston or Reading. <clears throat> um, but folks back then did not see themselves as white. Nobody in Europe in the 15, 16, 1700s called themselves white, right? It's an invention here in the Americas. Excuse me, and I'm getting somewhere with this. This is just a map that you'll see on, on the slides of the kingdom states of Europe in 1500. I think you saw it last time when we talked about Europe and Columbus. Here, on the other hand, is a European ethnic map designating sort of the ethno-linguistic groups, meaning they speak a different language, they have different cultural practices, eat different foods, etc. For example, here's German, and within Germany, man, there's so many different within Germany. This map could have been divided even further, but I couldn't find one that did. But I'm just showing you there's these Bretons over here, which relate more with the Western English Cornish over here, right? There's Finnish people who speak a unique language compared to the Swedes or the Norwegians. So here's an ethnic map of Europe in the early 1900s. <clears throat> Any questions or comments about that? No, okay. It also maps onto religious identities, right? This is in the 1550s and you've seen this map when we talked about our Spain lecture about the different religious identities in Europe. And this map, if you looked at it in the 21st century would be um, different, not 100% different, but it would be very different than this. So that's one way in which we differentiate um, ethnicities with race and what your national identity is. Turning to Africa, look at Africa's ethno-linguistic map, this one on the right. This one on the left is just a different version of it, but the one on the right is kind of what I'm trying to get at. What strikes you about the ethno-linguistic map of Africa? Luke, Jennifer, Victor. What There's, happens? There's a lot of them, right? Can you imagine if you have to paint by numbers with that map? <laughs> and you'd have to have a lot of little crayons and stuff. So my point here is that Africa's ethnicity is very diverse. There is not like one African identity. Like, hey, I'm an African, you're an African. That doesn't come until like the 1940s and 50s, this idea of a pan-African or whole African identity. And that has to do with colonialism and World War II, and we'll get into that in a couple of weeks. But at this time, nobody thought of them, themselves as African. Like <clears throat> Adiche, she thought about herself as from this one ethnic group right over here in Nigeria, right? That was her identity. But she had a Nigerian passport, which encompasses many ethnic groups. And then when she moved to the US, all of a sudden she was identified as black by others, like you said, Victor. <clears throat> Where am I getting at? What I'm getting at is the weaponization of this ethnicity. In other words, you're gonna be watching videos about how the industrial revolution created tools and medicines and guns to facilitate the European colonization of Africa. That's one aspect of it, like the material culture aspect of it, the stuff they had. Another aspect about how Europeans colonized Africa and were able to do this for a number of decades is the politics of conquest. Um, Pedro Valdivia did the same thing as Fernan Fernando Pizarro, taking advantage of the different ethnicities within um, South America. Adolf Hitler did, did it, taking advantage of the different ethnic makeup of you know, Jews versus non-Jews in Germany. This is nothing new. It's kind of from the scorecard of how to colonize and take power. So I'm just gonna give you the version to help you understand this book. And please stop me if you wish. So before many Europeans got there, um, well, let me rephrase that. Before the 1880s, Europeans had a couple footholds on the African continent. And they were mostly, are, what are you looking at? Are you looking at pictures or me? Pictures. Okay, good. Because I don't see the green thing around here. Okay. 
You're on the left hand side. There's like a columns of all of us, a column of of our faces on the on, okay. on my right. I mean, there we go. That way you won't. Now do you just see the big picture? Yeah, uh, this is the same. Oh, okay. I can't control things. Um, so let's go back to the lecture. Before the 1880s, there were various African states, the yellow things, right? And states are a political domain controlled by one, you know, a lead, leading group, whether it's a group of chiefs or one big chief or whatever. But that doesn't mean all these empty spaces didn't have people. They did. They just didn't, they weren't a big empire or a state. <clears throat> so what I do want to point out is there were states and empires within Africa before the Europeans came. The area we'll be looking at is Tipu Tib's domain here, right? That's the big main one according to this map. But Europeans were starting to get mostly trade footholds on the coast, right? On the coast, on the coast, on the coast. There's some trading houses built. We have the French, the British, the German, the Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, Ottomans, and others. Okay. <clears throat> Fast forward to 1885 at the Berlin Conference, which Otto von Bismarck, the brand new leader of a brand new Germany. This is about when Germany was invented. There was no Germany before the 1880s. Um, it was the unification of two major areas of Germany. So in 1885, at this Berlin conference, there were many, many dignitaries from these countries there, from Austria, Hungary, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Great Britain, Holland, Italy, Portugal, Russia, blah, 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 and the US. So these are folks largely from Europe, Eastern Europe, and the US. And what they're doing there is do you all see this map in the background? What's that map look like? It's only a partial vision of the continent. Looks like Africa. It's Africa. So what they're there to do is redraw the borders of Africa and to carve it up for themselves, right? Like, okay, Belgium, you get that part. Denmark, you get that part. France, you get that part. Germany, you get that part. <clears throat> Who's not at the table at this Berlin conference that you'll read about in chapter four? Four. Who's not on the table, right? This, no one in Africa, probably. No Africans are invited to the conference, right? Just like when I teach my US history class, no Native Americans were invited to many conferences about the future of the continent of the US. <clears throat> and what they came up with roughly was um, this sharing of power amongst European powers. And they said, all right, King Leopold, you'll, you can have the Belgian Congo down here. It's a much longer story than this, but you get the idea, right? The Portuguese can get Angola. The Germans can get East, um, German East Africa, which today is Tanzania, right? The Germans also get Cameroon and the French get some, the British get some, crazy, isn't it? And these, in 1885, these borders are just drawn on a map. It's not like these things actually existed at, as things yet, right? Um, and there were people who critiqued it. I know this is a very fuzzy wuzzy drawing. Can you kind of see what's going on? Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be out of von Bismarck, right? And he has a big knife. And what cake are they cutting up? Even though it's in French, you can probably read it. Yeah, Africa. Africa, Afrique. Yeah. And here are uh, various European folks saying, oh, wow, we get a piece of the cake. But there's no Africans at the table. Why was that? Okay. Why was that, people? Why were no Africans invited to the table to slice up Africa? What do you think, Luke or Victor? You're like, dude, that's your job, Rodriguez. Tell us. Because <clears throat> they were seen as less than. Um, they were seen as not worthy of running their countries. Plus, at this time, the Industrial Revolution, which you'll see in the other lecture, um, Europeans wanted to colonize various parts of the world. This was part of the new imperialism and the expansion that was happening. Um, 
that the Spanish started when the Spanish went to the Americas. Later on, other Western Europeans wanted the same thing. So the British went into India and other folks went into Africa. And that's what we're focusing on. Okay. <clears throat> the result of the new imperialism by 1914 is 84% of the world was controlled or claimed control by Europe and the United States, right? The United States had conquered the continent, Alaska, Hawaii, the Philippines and other places. And what these tiny Western European countries had claimed and conquered, you know, much of the rest of the world. As we'll see, this is um, foreshadowing for the last section of class, Afghanistan, not conquered. It's called the graveyard of empires for a reason, people. Here's Afghanistan not conquered by the new imperialism right here. So a little foreshadowing for part three come December. <clears throat> How is this done? So this is the gist of my lecture. Sorry for the long wind up. Um, what time is it? Three, okay, we're good. Um, any questions or comments so far? So the third example, um, well, another example of the weaponization of ethnicity and how the new imperialism European powers used it as a tool by which to extract, control land and extract resources and control people. I'm gonna look at the Belgian Congo, the subject of our book. So as you already have read, um, Prince, uh, I'm sorry, King Leopold was brilliant in sort of a evil tactician way of controlling the media and spreading word, right? And getting his message across. So when he talked to not only the Americans, but fellow Europeans about, hey, do you mind if I have this Congo state as my own private property? And it was his private property on paper. He called it the Congo Free State. And oh my gosh, that's like calling that Mapuche people's law that the Chilean government passed in 70, in 74 or so, the law to take back their land. Um, it's just totally naming something the opposite of what it is. So Leopold called it the a Congo Free State, and he said its goals were to end the slave trade, right? That they were gonna have humanitarian goals. They were gonna let humanitarian missions into there. There was gonna be free trade of everything that was extracted or imported into the Congo. And he would allow uh, European missionaries, right, both Christian and Protestant into there. He would allow philanthropists who are trying to build roads and do good and uh, build schools and what have you. And he would allow scientists, right, botanists and other folks who are going in there and studying stuff. So this was his goal that he stated to other people and to many Europeans and Americans were like, hey, cool, that sounds good, right on, right, more power to you, Leopold. <clears throat> Getting back to our example of treaties, uh, Henry Morton Stanley, and by the way, this, I don't know if this is the first time you've seen this image. Do you recognize this cool hat that this guy's wearing, Henry Morton Stanley? Have it, he maybe, made that, he created that. Yeah, have any of y'all been forced to go to Disneyland by your parents when you were a kid? <laughs> by the laugh, I can tell a couple of you have, right? And you know the jungle ride where there's that guy climbing the tree getting poked in the butt by the rhino? Right, that's, that's a straight up borrowing of Morton Stanley's um, outfit, right? And the whole Congo expedition, right? That's, that is literally a Disney-fied version of the Congo expedition, the jungle. Have any of y'all been on the jungle ride in Disneyland and do they still have it? Nobody? I don't remember. I don't remember. Well, that's a good thing. I don't think they have it anymore. Oh, wow. See? Wow. That's interesting. Okay. Right. So same as the other example I discussed, um, the Belgian colonial governor made a deal with the king of Cuba. And remember, Cuba is one of the big places in the Congo. Oh, I have a map right here. How cool that is. Right, the Cuba folks are right here, right? Big state right here, relatively speaking, big and densely populated, right on one of the tributaries of the major Congo River. So <clears throat> the Belgian authorities made a treaty with this guy, the King of Cuba, see him chilling back here, right? That's how a king chills in this part of the country. 
Um, and again, they're empowers, empowering the Cuba group against neighboring groups. So the Cuba group can help them, right, enslave and control labor of these other groups. <clears throat> right, and um, King Leopold and his minions in the force publique did it in this whole area here. This was their headquarters of operation right here, extracting rubber, first ivory, then rubber, right? And here's the delta of the Congo River. Somebody you're going to read, read about is Leon Rom. Go ahead. Oh, I didn't hear you, Jennifer. Okay. And the military force that um, the Con the Belgian Congo created was called the public force or force publique. You're going to read about the force publique, and it was headed by European mission uh, mission missionaries. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, European soldiers, right, and mercenaries, like this guy Leon Rom, and he's somebody you will be reading about. And here's his group of perhaps Cuba policemen. And there were, they were soldiers from non-local ethnic groups, right, whose job was to go force other people, like this guy in the middle, who's tied up, to go do work. Okay. So another image. Here is part of his force publique. That guy there, right, and that guy there. And these guys tied up, right, have been kidnapped from their village. Um, in order to do what? Has anybody gotten that far in King Leopold's Ghost? I think you have if you've read the introduction. What's the main thing the Belgian Congo makes money off of? What's their main export? To rubber. The rubber, 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 right? Because rubber was a booming product in the state, right? Scientists and like Joseph Dunlop had just figured out how to make rubber wheels for bikes, I'm sorry, for bikes, but also for machinery, because previously machinery used leather, right, in order to wind their gear. So now you have rubber for all kinds of things, bikes, and then later on cars, but that's later, later. Um, rubber was like this new great resource for this modernizing Western culture. And there's many countries who are what they call have the resource curse, like they're cursed with one big resource, and then other companies or countries come in and exploit that resource and make some people in the country very rich, but most of them like poorer. Venezuela is an example with oil. Nigeria is an example with oil. Congo is an example with um, rubber. <clears throat> so how do you force people to not do what their, their common practices are, which is um, planting and harvesting and raising pigs or chickens? and doing their everyday things. How do you like make them go do uh, harvest this rubber? Well, you kidnap, well, they kidnapped their wives and kids and made the male rubber trappers of the family go collect so much rubber and, and then they would uh, release their wives and kids. And this is hard work. Rubber is a big vine. It's a huge labyrinthine, just slithery vine. And you cut it a little bit so the rubber, the sap of the tree drips down into these pots here. Then you collect the pots and then you have a ball of rubber and you do it again and again and again. You don't wanna kill the tree, the vine, because then it'll stop um, producing rubber. And this is a big part of the book. You're, you're all gonna read much more details about this. But, but the point is, how were they able to do this? Um, you prefer you arm and you train one ethnic group of soldiers to go get another ethnic group and enslave them to do the work, right? And here's an example. But, and here's, um, oh, you know what? Let me ask you that question later. Um, so the legacy of the weaponization of ethnicity and land and labor control is, in the Congo at least, the Congo lost 10 million people, lost. 10 million people were killed, right, by the Belgian colonial enterprise between 1885 and 1906. At the time, um, the world knew about it. 
for example, how do you think, what do you, who do you think took these pictures? First of all, what do you see? What's up with the nine people in this picture? They're children, looks like. Yeah, most of them are children, except for this person in the middle. And what are they missing? Their hands. Yeah, so one of the practices of punishing these folks was to cut off their hands, as we discussed last time. Um, but who do you think took these pictures? Why would you take a picture of a person without a hand? You want to show it to the world. Yeah, exactly. Show it to the world. So that is why, as I said before, and I know redundancy, I keep repeating myself. This is a story of greed, terror, and, terror and heroism. So there's heroism on the part of the Africans who are rebelling against the Congolese, the Belgian enterprise. And there's heroism amongst the Europeans who are, and um, Americans who are trying to take pictures of this and get it out to the world to have it stop. Um, this is also leading up to Congo's uh, experiencing a long, a long civil war today, right? And as I said, you have people from Rwanda moving into the Congo. Those are largely Tutsis and others, people from Uganda who experience a lot of this post-colonial terror are moving into this part of the Congo. Also because there's a lot of minerals in the Congo today. So it's not much shocking foreshadowing, but this cycle of resource extraction and pitting one ethnicity over another is um, still happening today in uh, this part of the world and others.